Well, let's get started. Welcome to today's presentation of Stage Stories from the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts, or the Wallace, as we like to call it. My name is Mark Slavkin. I'm pleased to serve as Director of Education here at the Wallace. For those of you who don't know us or haven't had a chance yet to come to the Wallace, we were given the opportunity by the city of Beverly Hills to reimagine a historic post office building as a center for the performing arts. Uh, and today we have two beautiful theaters as well as a dedicated education wing as part of our campus. We present music and dance and theater and film and have a robust commitment to arts learning for people of all ages. Today's program called State Stories is part of our work in what is called creative aging, which is an emerging field to really recognize and celebrate that older adults have enormous artistry and creativity within us and should be given an opportunity and a platform to celebrate those skills and to share their artistry, their voice uh, with audiences and, and not to leave people to the side or, or not include them in, in any way. In this state story class, um, it really is about writing um, our personal stories, key moments from our lives that will then be performed or shared in a culminating event. Pre-pandemic, we would do this in person, and this evening we would be in our black box theater. But under current uh, COVID conditions, we are instead in Zoom world. But that has actually been a blessing to allow us to provide community and sort of a lifeline to the participants in this program, who not only are gaining some skills and knowledge, but gaining some new friends and a support group of peers that I think have helped us all weather a very difficult time. All this is possible thanks to the, the vision and amazing teaching of my colleague, Deborah Pascarette. She's really led our efforts to build out programs for older adults and has been the teacher of this class that we're honoring today. So to your friends, family, cousins, grandchildren, and neighbors, thank you for tuning in today to support these terrific folks. And I know you'll enjoy their stories. So with that, let me welcome Deborah Pascarette. Thank you, Mark. Hi, everyone, and good afternoon. Um, I'm Deborah Pascarette, as Mark said, and I serve as the manager of community engagement at the Wallace. And I also have the incredible opportunity to uh, teach the older adult courses uh, stage stories, which is the class you'll be seeing today, and our other class, Beyond Words. So today, um, I'm so excited that you are going to be able to hear our storytellers from our Thursday summer session class in their performance for the end of their uh, class time and share their stories with you. Over the last 10 weeks, they've answered to a different, different prompts, different ideas that were thrown out in class for them to write about. And it was their choice to decide which of those stories they wanted to share with you today. I wanted to also do a quick shout out to a new member of our team here at the Wallace who has been instrumental in helping me with classes, Victoria Kemsley, and you'll meet her later. But what I'd like to do now is get our stories going so you can hear all of them. Also, at the end of the show, we'll have a few minutes for questions and answers. So if you have a question that pops up during the show, hold on to it and at the end, put it in the chat or in the Q&A and I'll be able to facilitate that discussion with the writers. They'll all come back at the end of the show. So I would love to introduce our first storyteller for today, Anita Parnell. Good afternoon. My name is Anita Parnell. I remember there's a website on Facebook named, you know you are old school when, then you will see a picture say of an eight track tape deck or 45 RPM records and so on. If you knew what the picture was, that meant you were old school. One day I was browsing, avoiding something I should be doing of importance 
and the picture on the site was of a, cl a clothespin bag. Oh my God, I remember those. A rectangle shaped cloth bag on a hanger to hold clothespins. When my family moved to our house in 1965, my dad wanted to buy my mom a new washer and dryer. My mom said no, she only wanted a washing machine and asked my dad to put a clothesline in the backyard. She said there was nothing that smelled better than clothes kissed by the sun. The whites were brighter and the clothes fresher. So he spent a day digging holes for the metal poles and then strung the lines across them. My mom bought a clothespin bag and several packs of clothespins. The first ones were one piece, a sort of uh, a, a sort of shaped like a long two-pronged wooden bell. While after a while, we'd buy the two-piece ones held together with a metal spring. I didn't particularly like or dislike when it was my turn to hang up the load of clothes. However, our dog Flash loved the clothes hanging on the line because he liked to run through the towels and swing on the sheets and pull them down. My mom would get at him too because that meant we had to rehang or we rewash them. Letting my mind run through those memories as I remember, my mom took pride as a homemaker and kept our clothes crisp, clean, and fresh. Remember cloth embroidered doilies? My mom would make a batch of chalk-like Argo starch adding water, then she soaked the doilies in the starch, then ironed them really pretty until they sat up on the edges. She would put them on the coffee tables and set a glass of a glass swan shaped candy dish on them. My mom always wanted us to look our best when we left the house. She made a point to get my dad's work t-shirts extra sparkly and spot clean those grease stains. Remember, this was before permanent press clothes. For my dad's dress shirts, she would sprinkle water and a little Argo starch on them and ball them up to dampen them before ironing. Remember, before there was Kleenex tissues, we only used cotton handkerchiefs back then. Remember that? My mom would wash, lightly starch, iron, and fold stacks of them for my dad and her. I still can see me putting them in their top dresser drawers. My dad was a minister, so she made sure he had several to take with him on Sunday, especially one that matched the color of his suits to put in his coat pocket. When the hankies got worn, she would special order monogram ones for him, especially for Father's Day. Her hankies had lace corners. In elementary school, my, if my brother and I needed to take money to school to pay for something, she would wrap the coins and tie them in the one corner of a hanky so we wouldn't lose the money. Last night, my daughter called about something unrelated and I recounted this story to her. Since my parents passing, she and my son-in-law live in my family home. While going through the house, finding and sharing, sharing many sentimental items of my parents, she happened upon one of my mom's hankies. She reminded me that she carried that hanky with her on her wedding day to remember my mother. That was 12 years ago. I had totally, totally forgotten about that. It brings tears of joy to my eyes. My mother got to share in that special day. Wow, thank you. I would like to introduce our next writer, Linda Levinson. Thank you, Anita. My prompt was things I remember, things I don't remember. I wrote this in honor of my maternal grandmother, Elsa Kalashak, or Nana Muddy to me. My maternal grandmother had warm blue eyes, 
wavy silver hair and always wore a button down print dress and black thick heeled lace up shoes. She spoke German to my mother and English to me. What I don't remember is the taste of the potato kugel that my grandmother made from scratch. I can picture it sitting on the flowery tablecloth of her round dining room table, warm from her turquoise oven. Potholders on each side, it sat on a trivet like a queen in its deep, round, clear pirate's glass dish. She would take off her apron and prepare to sit down while I looked forward to tasting the crisp, dark, hash brown-like crust that covered the top and sides of the kugel. Having watched her hand grate the potatoes made it even more special. There is no one left alive who knows how she made her kugel. Over the years, I have tried recipe after recipe, hoping to replicate my childhood memory. The ingredients are simple. Matzo meal or potato flour, eggs, onions, salt, pepper, and some sort of fat. Each cookbook, newspaper, or magazine recipe I have tried has been a slightly different variation, but none of them tasted like hers. Now, I think that her recipe may have been made with schmaltz, chicken fat, from the jar she kept on her refrigerator shelf. Now that she is no longer alive, at least once a year, I still try a new kugel recipe, but I am always disappointed in the results. And after a few bites, just to make sure, I toss it out. As I am writing this story, it occurs to me that maybe I didn't really like the taste of her kugel at all. That what I loved was being with her, watching her create multiple course dinners from farmer's market ingredients we picked out together. And taking that first bite into the crispy brown crust, as opposed to the gray potato mush that made up the inside of the kugel and never really tasted very good. And now I'd like to introduce Audrey. Thank you, Linda. Hi, I'm Audrey. And uh, the name of my story is Memories. I remember my name. That's easy. I don't remember where I wrote it down. I remember when I was born. I don't remember what I did yesterday. This started about a decade ago, I think. Uh, I uh, think everyone my age is complaining about the same thing. Everyone is worried and wondering who is worse. <laughs> My doctor says, I'm fine. My brother says, my doctor's nuts. So I watched a movie on Netflix for fun and to tell my brother all about it. Then I couldn't remember what I watched. I locked myself out of my house and couldn't find my keys. I called a locksmith and paid $460 to unlock the doors and make new keys. Exhausted, I got ready to go to bed and then 
felt something in my back pocket as my jeans fell to the floor. And there they were, $460 I spent. I will always remember that. What I could have bought with $460. I could have flown up north to see my grandchildren or bought that beautiful outfit I saw, but told myself it was too expensive. I can't remember if I took my medications this morning. I just stared at them. So I took the one again that helps me not cough. Twice is probably better than once. So big deal, retook 500 milligrams of calcium with vitamin D and one from the green, green bottle. Two is probably much better than one, right? Time to go. Where are my car keys? My purse? On the table? Why would they be in the bathroom? Okay, step outside, locked door. Now, where am I going? And now I'd like to introduce Rosa. Thanks, Archie. Hi, everyone. My name is Rosa. The title of my story is, I am from, I'm from the East Coast, the West Coast, and nowadays from in between. I'm from the Bronx, population 1,435,000. First generation Puerto Ricans settling there for a better life. From evening walks through the teeming streets of the Bajo, relishing island culture and the music and smell of soul food in the air. I'm from the riffing of conga drums on tenement rooftops on hot summer nights. And from men in Guayaberas huddled on sun-kissed mango crates playing dominoes in front of bodegas. I'm from being raised by a gambler a father placing bets on the island game of Bolita. I'm from Los Angeles metro area, population 3,739,000. I'm from the streets of East LA, from the Chicano movement, protest songs, boycotts, and picket strikes for the rights of farm workers to organize. I'm from looting and rioting during the Chicano moratorium civil unrest. From a night in jail, from a husband who did six months in county for inciting to riot. I'm from civil disobedience to pacifism, from living in a Buddhist community for 18 years, moved by Rodney King's entreaty can't we all get along? And finding in Dr. King's teaching that not everyone can be famous, but everyone can be great. Greatness is determined by service. Today, I'm from Yellow Springs, population 3000. Adjusting to a smaller world, I take it in. The Village Weekly prints police dispatches. Last Monday, numerous complaints were received that several loose pigs were roaming in an intersection. The Yellow Springs police arrive and along with the owner corral the animals. On June 30th at 1.15, an officer observed a suspicious vehicle parked on Corey Street. The vehicle, he noted, was cold to the touch and unoccupied. No further action was needed. Outside my window, a deer grazes on the foliage on my front porch. Startled, it canters away. Where did it go? 
it's now my pleasure to introduce our next writer, Fran. Fran, you're muted and we can't hear you. So sorry. Thank you, Rosa. Hello, I am Fran. The piece I will read is something I have won in my lifetime. I was 18 and had decided to put off college for a while. One rainy New York City day, I woke up to go out into the world and find work for myself. My sister stared me in the right direction to an agency that she knew. I found myself on the streets of New York City where everyone seemed to be wearing white go-go boots. Before I knew it, that very morning, I landed a position and I was sitting behind my new desk. My new job was at a large dress house in the garment center. I shared an office with my new boss, Mr. Harold Franks, and model, model sketcher. I worked there three years until my boss moved to another dress house. I was often asked to model dresses in the showrooms and dresses were fitted on me in the seamstress rooms. Samples were offered to me. I had some wonderful clothes, black and white pinstripe stripe Dacron suit with white bow tie, a green speckled evening dress cut on the A-line. I was the perfect size. My best friend, Joan, worked for the general manager, Rudolph Bing, at the Metropolitan Opera House. I was invited to the opening night of Anthony and Cleopatra at the new Lincoln Center. When Mr. Finkelstein, the tailor at work, heard of my invitation, he insisted on dressing me up for the occasion. The only request was, the dress would be returned after that night. I was decked out in a three-piece costume, jacket and long skirt made of silver mylar and pink mohair. The shell top was pink velvet sleeveless with a cowl neckline. I was Cinderella for the night. I walked into the Met with those beautiful Chagall panels hanging in the lobby, visible from the plaza outside, the opera house. No cell phones in those days, so unfortunately, no pictures. Though my inner camera recalls the outfit I wore in every detail. I would now like to introduce the next uh, writer, Helene. Thank you, Fran. Hello, everybody. My name is Helene, and today I'm reading my story, The Field of Prolonged Childhood. He was a farm boy, unusual in the middle of a mid-century experiment in suburban uniformity, but scattered among Levittown's neat rows of identical houses were some vestiges of the country life that existed before the community broke ground in 1952. A small forest bisected the neighborhood. A tiny pond was home to a family of ducks who lived in splendid isolation before 17,311 boxes with red doors and garages invaded their habitat. An apple farm commanded considerable acreage on the Northwest border of the planned community. Families frequented the farm regularly, mine included, to pick apples during harvest season, buy pies and apple butter and baskets of Macintoshes and Red Delicious, to inhale the deep sweet scent of autumn encapsulated in a hay piled rustic store in front of the farmhouse where Bill, the farm boy, lived. He and I were good friends and never more than that. Although we were both in the same high school class, I don't think he had started his sexual journey yet. I had begun to interact with the wider world of politics and dystopian literature and existentialism and the opposite sex, 
while he lived with one foot in an old fashioned orchard and another in a swashbuckling adventure novel. And I loved him for that. Several times a year, we would skip the school bus and meet at dawn's light on the edge of the great field and walk three miles to school together. Once we stepped onto the expanse of dirt and scrub, our old world dropped away and we'd each hop on one leg holding hands and make up songs and slay dragons in the enchanted space between our homes and the oak line drive that led to Neshaminy High School's double glazed glass front doors. Bill did most of the dragon slaying as he always carried a wizened wooden stick perfect for poking fire breathers in the belly. I wore the leather strung amulet he carved for me from a felled branch from one of the farm's trees. The knobby three pronged pendant reminded me of arthritic witch's fingers, holding it out in front of me released magic that thwarted goblins in our path, giving us a brief respite on our arduous journey to higher education. Our winter walks were the best. The land was white with dusts of snow and scattered sheets of ice which glinted in the glow of the rising sun. Our breath sent fronds of smoke to the sky, like two chimneys keeping huddled peasants warm in their stone cottages. Bill's ears always turned magenta, in spite of the ear flaps on his plaid woolen hunter's cap. His heavy work shoes gave him a sure tread, so he wrapped me in his arms and kept me upright and warm, in spite of my impractical beaded suede moccasins and flimsy Indian print bedspread skirt, as we battled the tundra tyrants swirling in the frosty winds, trying to knock us off course. Here, in the great field, there was no trigonometry or history of Western civilization or fights by the lockers after school. The teacher who spit when he talked the scowling hall monitor, the inedible Salisbury steak on chipped plastic trays, the pot smoke in the bathroom. Here, all that was gone, cleared away, forgotten. The jocks who pushed Bill every time they passed him in the stairwell, the leather jacketed girls who let their boyfriends feel them up behind the gym and who lobbed jiggly lemon jello at my neck in the lunchroom. The principal who made my mother come and convinced me to return to the class instead of marching with the striking teachers. They dared not come to the great field. This was ours alone, where we could embrace childhood, make up stories, and always, always win. Thank you for listening. Now, I'm delighted to introduce our final writer of the afternoon, Jovial. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jovial, and uh, my piece is due to the prompt memory. <clears throat> it was a spooky place of great mystery to me as a child. It was the church of my Paris, St. Francis of Assisi, Astoria, Queens, New York City all the other Catholic churches in my area, and there were a lot of them, were these big cement monoliths with tall bell towers and forbidding architecture, not St. Francis. It was built by the farmers who inhabited the area when this part of New York City was filled with dairy farms. It was a wooden structure, no cement or rebar steel, one story with no bell tower. There were steps leading up to the double heavy wooden doors that opened onto the back vestibule. A small staircase to the left led up to the choir loft and the aroma of days old church incense hung in the air. The inner doors opened up to a double set of wooden pews, about 20 rows on each side. The side walls were adorned with garish frescoes representing the Stations of the Cross. In the rear, on both sides, were the forbidding-looking confessional boots. At the opposite end of the building was the altar. 
a raised platform with a rail going across the whole length in the front. The altar was a place of hidden fascination. Only the priest and the altar boys were ever allowed on the other side of the railing. This became a place that was central to my life for the next 14 years. Every Sunday morning with my parents and brother and sisters and with my class from the attached school for eight years. Becoming an altar boy meant being allowed entrance behind the scenes, a mystery no longer. Here, the priest's garments hung in the closet. The sacristy was where the unblessed communion hosts were kept. The shelf with the unblessed wine. The room where we put on our altar boy cassocks. It was terribly exciting and felt like I was a part of some secret society. The mass at that time was said entirely in Latin. As an altar boy, I had to learn the entire mass, the priest's part and the congregation's response. I became obsessed with all the rites and rituals of the church. After learning all the words in Latin, I started sneaking unblessed communion host out of the sacristy and taking them home. I would then say mass in my parents' basement and distribute the host to the neighboring kids who came to my masses. Dominus Vobiscum, Ectum Spiritu Tuo, in el nombre de Padre Delito de la Spiritu Sancto. Amen. It was a terribly exciting thing for this young boy to be allowed and indoctrinated into this behind the scenes part of this mysterious world of Catholicism. The other altar boys used to guess about who would become a priest. Not me. I was determined to be the first American Pope. <laughs>